to a new edition of the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino. On this episode, we talk with sports writer and author Andy Fry. He has written for Rolling Stone, ESPN, the Chicago Tribune, and other publications. Over his career, he has interviewed hundreds of professional athletes, rock stars, and other celebrities. His book, 90 Days in the 90s, is a plot-driven fiction story that encompasses everything he loves. Chicago, sports, music, urban legends, history, pop culture and more. Enjoy this interview. Andy, thanks for taking a minute out, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Good to talk to you. So let's start off here before we get into your life, before we get into your book and kind of how we've woven this path to right now. You know, COVID mm-hmm. turned everything upside down for the last couple of years. And as somebody yeah. that's creative, that's out there, that's driven, how did this kind of change the way that you live your life now, you know, good and bad? Yeah, you know, I, I when COVID started, it was weird because I, um, as a part of my sports writing, sometimes I get to go on, I get invited to, to, to different trips. And, you know, sometimes it's just like local stuff, like something in, in Chicago, I'll go to um, a sports-related thing like the Cubs convention. Mm-hmm. In January 2020, I had actually gone to, you know, it, I live in Chicago where it's cold. I, I had gone to the Bahamas for like five days and met Greg Norman, who at the time was promoting... Uh, you know, he's got a, 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 a deal with Sandals Golf Courses, and so basically went down to kind of um, not unveil, but sort of reintroduce one of his golf co- golf courses. And, and the first, basically, the first outing of the Corn Ferry Tour, which is the, kind of the second tier tour under the PGA Tour, kicked off at the first event there, like literally on January eighth or ninth or something. So um, I was kind of in euphoria, and then we come back, and you know, I'm here a little bit about. COVID-19, uh, to me, it's just like, oh, it's it's another SARS, it's another bird flu, you know, some, a couple of people will get sick here, and, you know, that'll be it, and maybe it'll blow over. And then, you know, fast forward to about St. Patrick's Day in Chicago, I think, was around about the time that we got the shelter in, in place order from the mayor, and it all kind of seemed to, you know, multiply at that point. Um, I've worked from home for the last couple of years, ever since I sort of left my last corporate job and sales and, and really pursued the writing full time. So I was, you know, it wasn't weird for me and the way that I always looked at it, I'm not trying to like um, be Mr. Sonny or, or minimize things, but like I just approach it like, okay, this is weird and this is maybe difficult. I I always took every day as, you know, I was happy that I didn't wake up with a fever and no one in my, my family did and that we, you know, had what we had and just kind of dealt with it day by day. I mean, I'm, 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 I just turned 50 um, in April. I'm, you know, Gen X, so I guess we're part of it. You know, they say we're part of a generation that we're, we're the latchkey kids. We're sort of used to uh, coming home from school and being home by ourselves, letting ourselves in with the key and having to occupy ourselves and be creative. And, you know, we don't get, I guess, bugged out by the little, the little things. You know, I'm, I'm not on social media out there talking about how, you know, bummed I am, or or it, it was just to me, it was like, yeah, this is terrible. It's um, definitely a challenge. You know, I didn't know where the economy was going to go, but I just kind of counted my blessings and said, okay, this is weird. Um, my, luckily, my kid who was in eighth grade at the time didn't really mind doing school at home on a computer once they figured out how to do that. And um, you know, I just worked at home and walked the dog a lot more and made lunches at home and, and used it as an opportunity to. Buckled down with my writing, and I remember with March, I didn't know what the hell I was going to write about because sports was on hold, but quickly the, the next month's five stories that I did were about, you know, what's going on? Like, I think I covered the Cornhole League, and I covered, you know, sort of like what pro athletes are doing now that they can't be on the field. So I talked to a couple of basketball football players who were like, same thing as I was doing, talking about walking their dog a lot and, you know, uh, adopting another dog. And I talked to... Megan Rapinoe's partner, um, Sue Bird, and, the, you know, they were, I think they got stuck in Connecticut because that's where Sue Bird is, she plays in the Northeast, and, you know, they were just kind of like doing extra exercises and board games and talking with people on Zoom, and so it changed the dynamic of the story, but I, I was always thankful that, you know, I'm cautious about my health, that I wasn't affected by it, um, although I worked hard to keep my, myself and my family healthy. And they just tried to take it in stride as much as he could. So that's my take. 
let's get into your writing life. How did all this begin for you? Talk to me a little bit about, you know, kind of where you were born and raised and how this desire to write and, and, and go down this sports path happened for you. Yeah, I grew up in the Philadelphia area. Um, I moved to Chicago in 1994 after college. And at the time, you know, 1994, like, nobody, nobody was getting jobs anywhere. I knew people went to Yale and Cornell, you know, who were a year or two old, and then you came back and worked for the Park District because they, they couldn't get a job elsewhere. But, you know, I knew a handful of people were, you know, were getting jobs or internships in Chicago, and I knew I was going to live in a big city. And literally, I didn't, I guess my attitude is sort of indicative of this, that I'd never been here, but I started sending resumes. Like, we actually sent paper resumes and put them in the mail back then. And my dad said, well, you need to go, if you want to live in Chicago, maybe you need to go pound the pavement. And, you know, he's a, like an ad man from, you know, who got out of college in the early 60s. And he said, you know, you need to go pound the pavement and, you know, I'll walk into the office of J. Walter Thompson and hand him your resume, which, like, you can't even get in buildings anymore. I, I don't know that you could really back then as, as much, too. But um, so I just came here, and I he kind of knew nothing other than, I had this writing hobby. I wanted to live in a major city. I didn't know what the heck I was going to do. I was kind of drawn towards sales because I guess I was I've always been a decent communicator, and uh, I can talk about how sort of the entrepreneurial mindset has helped in my writing you know, later on if you want. But yeah, I just you know I was you know like any other 22 year old in Chicago living in you know, Lakeview and Wrigleyville with another another guy you know, eating ramen noodles every night, rubbing nickels together, and just kind of trying to enjoy going out to a concert or a, you know a game every once in a while. Uh, yeah, I mean, I worked in, I sold investments, I did I worked for a bank, uh, settled some time in IT, but the, the underlying current was that I always had a hobby, kind of like a dabbling uh, thing where I did some writing, and sometimes it was just putting together kind of a dumb newsletter for my friends, or, you know, in the 90s, I, I, my best friend and I had like a zine, we called them zines, you know, you go review a band and you assemble it all together, you take it to a printer and spend 200 bucks and you get like a little, you know, kind of podunk version of a newspaper that you drop off at record stores for free. So I did that and, you know, spent some time, more time in the corporate world and somewhere along the line, um, kind of after building relationships in the business world, I, I didn't have any contacts in journalism, but I, I think I just kind of figured out that, well, you know, if I could build, you know, build contacts with, you know, businesses and sell, and, uh, and people that I, I'm doing business with, you know, maybe the same thing will work in journalism. And I just started really writing a sports blog kind of to be sane when I was selling insurance investments. I think I was working like 60 hours a week and, you know, doing all kinds of stuff that you do when you work for a big insurance company, like a, a lot of unnecessary paperwork. There's a lot of follow-up with, you know, pencil pushers and underwriters and paper stuffers. And it's, um, you know, it's not really a, a business I recommend if you are someone who's all about, you know, results in getting things done quickly and efficiently. But I coped by writing a blog once or twice a week about sports topics. And you know, I'm fascinated with weird things that are cultural in sports, like the fact that, you know, at least traditionally in America, everybody who grows up Irish Catholic loves Notre Dame, but nobody really goes to USC because they're a Methodist. Or, you know, the, all the Italian-Americans that I knew – who weren't diehard Phillies fans when I was growing up had an affinity, affinity for the Yankees, or at least like my friend's dad's because of Joe DiMaggio, played for the Yankees in the 50s. You know, there's all these cultural tie-ins, and I started to write about that and rivalries and things, and just kind of like would bug like eight or ten of my friends at home, like, hey, I wrote this thing, what do you think about it? You know, do you want to start an argument over sports? And that's how I started, and eventually I was able to kind of set some goals and decided that I wanted to try to get something published in the next five years back in 2011. And, you know, within about 18 months, I think, blew through that goal and published my first article for ESPN in July of uh, 2011. In, in the, all the annals of sports, as a sports writer, what has been your favorite sports moment to witness? You mean to, w to witness? Not necessarily write about. Um, I don't know. This is, I mean, there's at least half a dozen I was here in Chicago for the second run of Michael Jordan and the Bulls. And, all right, so maybe you can say that I, I latched on like any, you know, a bandwagon, I don't know. But it's the culture that I remember, so you see this somewhat in The Last Dance, if you watch the documentary series. And, I, you know, it took me, I didn't have full cable at the time, so I didn't watch it right when it came out. But, I mean, I've watched it three times since. There was a time in late 90s Chicago where, 
the Bulls are on, you know, two to three nights a week. You walk into any bar, and everybody is paying to – everybody's tuned into the game. You know, and then at commercial break halftime, you know, we all talk about not just how awesome Jordan is, but, you know, Randy Brown's perimeter defense or, you know, some Jason Caffey's rebounding or, you know, Steve Kerr's role as, you know, sort of the second point guard coming in to save the day. And it was the same thing. I worked at IT at the time, at IT, for coming to the suburbs. And I would come in every, every, you know, Monday morning after a Bulls weekend. You know, I would talk to the grandma who worked in the call center who would also talk to me about Randy Brown's perimeter defense. Like, it's not just, yeah, Michael Jordan's my favorite, so I have another tour. Like, people were deep cut into it all over the place, tuned in every night. You know, it's just something that we stopped to do, and it was an experience that we shared um, that was, you know, it, it, it was pervasive throughout the Chicago area. Um, to kind of put a highlight on it, I lived right on Clark Street, north of Diversity. It's a major street in, on the north side. It's about maybe like a, a mile and a quarter down from Wrigley Field. So each time the Bulls won, won the last of their three championships in 96, 97, 98, within about 10 minutes, all of a sudden, there's people outside my door all over the street high-fiving, you know, cars are honking, people are high-fiving each other, people come out with pots and pans and, you know, cook spoons and they're banging them pots and pans and everybody's friendly, and, like, the cops are, you know, they're high-fiving people, too, and it was just an experience that it wasn't just about winning a game or having the best player, best team. It was something much more than that that I thought was really sunk in. Yeah, that last chance was amazing, and I actually really watched sports a lot then and totally forgot about how he left spring training and came back and how miraculous that whole thing was. I, I couldn't imagine living through that, like, every year, you know, just knowing that there's a chance you could be a champion. Um, well, so, so to add one thing, so it all kind of it all started off. I remember I was living with a guy who grew up in the Chicago area. I come home. I want to say this is probably this must be in September, and I come home, and the first thing he says to me, this is this is in 1996. He's like, you know, we just got Dennis Rodman, and I was like, yes, I heard the news. Like this is before internet. I must have heard it on the sport radio. Like. Like, it was like, wow, we got a really good power forward. We got rid of Will Purdue. And that was kind of the start of my relationship with my roommate, spending two, three nights a week watching the Bulls. And a lot of times it was like they're down, with, they're down by 15 with two minutes to go, and you know they're going to pull it off. They're, they're going to come back, and, you know, they go 72 and 10. And it was just kind of like, oh, it was just remarkable. So I, I, I would definitely say there's all kinds of angles and definitely stories I can tell about that. But it was much more than just, a great team that, that won and dominated a couple seasons in a row. Anyhow. Yeah, no, I get it. So as a writer, what was the book for you that you come back to now? What was the book that really kind of opened your eyes that you think about as one of your favorites out of all time? Well, you know, I mostly read, <coughs> excuse me, nonfiction books. Um, I grew up, so I grew up in the Philadelphia area. I always loved reading the Sunday sports paper, and I always liked reading Sports articles in non-sports publications. So, like, uh, the New York Observer used to be pretty good, and, and um, you know, sometimes in, like, The Nation and, and The Atlantic Monthly, they'll, they'll have an article about um, a sports thing. Or, um, you know, like the Sunday, it's actually the Saturday version of The New York Times used to be really good because it was sort of like the anecdotal cultural stories about sports, not last night's game that they would spend. So I was always drawn to books by people like George Plimpton, um, and Dick Schaap that would write about, you know, your favorite athletes, favorite moments, but really, like, as I've just sort of described it, the Bulls in the last dance, getting into it a cut, a cut deeper and talking more to the people and the fans and the, the experience of being a fan and absorbing sports cult, culture, not just, like, the great touchdown that happened or the great, uh, you know, the, the game-winning shot. So I've, I guess I've always, like, I've loved to read periodicals and short books about sports that are kind of conversational with the way they've been written. Um, I mean, maybe on the fiction side, one of my favorites is uh, there's a couple of books by Michael Chabon. There's The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, and then the follow-up was called The uh, Wonder Boys, which they made a really hilarious movie with Michael Douglas out of that. Um, a lot of, like, you know, small scenes where quirky things happen, just kind of everyday type stuff versus, you know, I'm, I'm not really into big o overarching themes like... Uh, you know, gone with the wind type stuff. It's more I want to know about people's quirks and why they wear the shoes they wear and 
why they follow a sports team. So yeah, um, you know, uh, George Clinton's the X factor where he covers sports, but he, he does it kind of in a quirky way, and he he visits with different successful people about their sort of their sports hankerings and then what drives them. And then um, you know, a couple of books by Michael Chabon, and also as a music fan, I love anything by Nick Hornby. My High Fidelity is probably the the pinnacle, but Fever Pitch was really great too. So yeah, there's a couple I'd have to say. But what do you like the best about actually writing about sports? What is it that gets you going about it? Uh, for me, it's it's kind of getting to know the athlete. But so I get I get to interview a lot of athletes. Um, you know, most of it's on the phone or over Zoom these days. But you know, I, the way that I always look at it is, even if an athlete's super famous, they are people too. And if you talk to someone like a person, they're going to talk to you like a person. So. Uh, yeah, the, one of the first major sports legends I got to interview a couple of years ago was Johnny Bench, and um, he was doing a commercial. I don't know if you remember this commercial, but um, I want to say it must have been 2018. Uh, Major League Baseball decided to have opening day on the same day for all teams, so everybody played on March 29th. So I saw this commercial a couple of times where Johnny Bench, he's literally sitting at a desk and he's like cold calling fans like we do in sales, like cold calling fans. Saying, you're going to be there on the 29th. You're going to be there. You're going to be there. Um, I remember thinking like if, if I can find the publicist who did this and maybe stalk him, you know, email him, maybe I'll get an interview with Johnny Bench because apparently they paid him. You know, Kingsford Charcoal paid him some money to do this commercial. And I, I, I got an interview with him. It was supposed to be a 10 minute interview where we talked for maybe like 20, 25 minutes, mostly about like grilling, like how he likes to do his steaks, his secret rub. He wouldn't give me a recipe, of course, for his secret rub. Um, you know, he's a real grill master. And I think he, I think at least the time he lived in South Florida, which to me sounds hot. I don't know that I would grill in South Florida, but he was all about, you know, grilling in hot weather and getting your, your, your grill as hot as possible so he could put in his, I think, put in his steaks really quick. And he, he's, I think he's got some teenager college age sons at the time, so he's talking about kind of uh you know, giving them their hot dogs and their uh their burgers and getting that out of the way so he could do his little artiste thing with it. So I like that. I want to hear I mean, yeah, there's enough sportscasters and sports writers who stick a mic in an athlete's face and ask them the tough questions and you know, try to get inside their mind. I just want to talk to people like people. So I've had I think more success and more fun that way. And, you know, maybe we all get this, but uh, I feel like a lot of times I get, you know, that's a good question, or I'm, thanks for bringing that up. Um, give you another example. I've talked to Venus Williams a couple times. And the first time I talked to her, uh, I knew that she was kind of introverted. I did some research, and I kept finding on YouTube her getting, like, asked really stupid personal questions by, even by tennis reporters. And it, towards the end of her interview, I was like, yeah, I, you know, I did a little research. I know she you get asked a lot of dumb questions. Does that bother you? And she kind of laughed. She's like, yeah, thanks for recognizing that. Yeah, I think I get asked stuff that I shouldn't get asked. Um, and she kind of, you know, she didn't say anything bad about the reporters, but she kind of let on that, like, yeah, the least part, fun part of the job is that you have to entertain these dumb questions from, you know, reporters trying to get an outside angle or trying to get something juicy. And, you know, she just wants to play tennis and do her, her charity and her design work and enjoy life like we do. And I think when you can ask people about that, then they respond well. And for me, at least, I've found that my articles, I think, are more interesting. And, you know, people tell me that, that they like to read what I've written because it's, it's a little different. I used to write sports um, when I was in college and a little bit after, and that was one of the reasons why I left the industry. I just they're all, all people were interested in were angles at that time. You know, what was and, and I still hear that in Kansas City Sports Radio. It's like, how can we really light Inferno? And it's such an exhausting process. And these athletes just, they, they, they smell it, you know, and it's like they just get so, uh, I, I get to see them being tired. But my son is special needs, and we went to Royal Stadium the other day, and we met Nikki Lopez, who's from Chicago. And yeah. he just was walking around, and he was talking to us, and I you know, he was asking questions to all these kids, and I just kind of slipped one in and said, and I don't know if you remember this, but his first home run was in Omaha. They played an exhibition game, and he had just yeah. gotten called up, and it was a week later, and I could just, like, even talking about it now gets me just the hairs on my neck. Like, it was the, the home run, and it was where he played all of his minor league ball, and it was you know, close to home, and it was pretty amazing. But I could just see he was comfortable. It was it was a good flow, and but I could see him 
also being skeptical when a question was about ready to come up because those guys get inundated with idiocy consistently, and I feel bad for them having to do that. I mean, the other athletes, they got to go through it, but the mundane, idiotic stuff in the digs that reporters put out is just, it, it's, it's old as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I figure it's not my personality to do that anyway, but it's, it's, it's at the same time, I feel like. You know, I'm not going to get – I got an opportunity. That it didn't go through. Uh, someone offered me an interview with Lance Armstrong about the time that he – kind of when he settled all his legal stuff and he, he had a podcast. I don't know if he still has a podcast, but um, it was kind of, you know, at the back end of Johnny Bench, and it was kind of a big deal. And I don't remember why it didn't come to fruition, but – um, I was telling some friends about it, and they're like, oh, you're going to ask him how why he cheated? And you know, it's like, no, I think Oprah already covered that, so why does why do I need to talk to him about it? Like, you know, I'm going to kind of talk about it. So I just sort of developed questions from the point of view that I, you know, let's have a conversation. Let's keep the conversation. There's not, I'm not a nationally syndicated, like I'm not the, you know, the daily sports writer for the Tribune or the New York Times. So there's not, there's not going to be anything that I'm going to uncover that's going to make my stuff go viral. So why try to be that person? I, I just want to have – I'm not I'm, I'm not afraid to ask tough questions. I mean, I, I'll ask people, like, you know, sometimes why do you do this or what, what's – tell me about your hobbies, yada, yada. But I think by and large, I just try to talk to, like, people. And it, it, I think that is – it just makes the, the experience more pleasurable for, for each of us. Absolutely. I agree. So 90 days in the 90s. Talk to me about this book. How did it come about, and you know, how, what's the reception been? Yeah, so um, you know, I'm 50, and I grew. I remember the 90s, and um, I used to have a kind of a running joke with my best. My best friend's almost at my age, and he lived in Chicago for a while. I was a sports, uh, sorry, a short story writer named Doug Milam. He moved up to the Pacific Northwest a couple of years ago, and we used to have kind of like he's kind of more of a science nerd. Like I don't follow science fiction. Uh, we had kind of this running joke that like we should go back in time and see, like, Jimi Hendrix's last concert, or we should go here. And so I don't know. I just kind of always held on to that in my mind. And as a writer, I think most writers, whether you write, whether you want to write fiction or not, fiction, you, like, you always have it in your, your, on your bucket list to write a book, in part because you want to see if you can write a book, see if you can pull it off. So I toyed around with a couple ideas for a while, and literally five years ago, um, Easter, I was up in Traverse City visiting some friends, and I, I was like, um, my son and my friend Dave and his son, they went golfing or mini golfing. The girls went out and went shopping. I was basically at, at their house by myself doing some work. I had to do some work. And then I got done with my work. I took a walk. And I, I started putting, putting together, uh, I had like 75 playlists on Spotify. And I think I was listening to one of my 90s playlists. I just got this idea like, I think it was being nostalgic. I thought, oh, it would be cool if I could go back to the 90s. Um, and it was before I had seen, I had never seen Portlandia, I had never seen Hot Tub Time Machine, if that movie was out at that point, I don't remember. And just got this idea of like, okay, well, you know, what would, what would a tra time travel to the 90s in Chicago, because I live in Chicago, what, what would that be like? What would I do? Where would I go? You know, where would I eat? What, you know, would I go see a band? Would, you know, would I check in on old friends? And I just, with write some writers, some of us, we, uh, we get a lot of ideas, and so for me, the test is if I write something down that I'm really excited about, and I still care about it a week or two later, you know, versus like coming back and saying, oh, that's boring or stupid. Um, yeah, I decided that I cared about this idea about two weeks later. I had it written down somewhere and was taking notes and just thinking like, oh, this would be cool and maybe I should do this. So I just decided to try it out. And when you start writing a book, you know, books are 70,000 to 100,000 words. Like, you don't really know what the hell you're going to write when you start, but I had a vision for the plot, at least, or what, what it would be about. And I really love pop culture. I love sports. I love, you know, I'm not a history, I'm not an educated history book, but I love, like, you know, oral histories and anecdotes, and, you know, I can give you stories about shortcuts to the airport that Cubs players took back in the 80s and 90s, because, you know, if you live in Chicago, you know the neighborhoods, you know the streets. I'm fascinated with those little things. So I just started toying with it, started picking at it, and started writing, you know, trying to write plots, trying to like di write dialogue, and um, it took a little while to kind of figure out. But I really wanted to write a story about going back to the 90s and really experiencing, okay, if you're going to go back in time travel, 
and you're a grown-up and you don't have any responsibility, what are you going to spend your time doing? And, and I wanted to make it a story where someone kind of got immersed in the 90s. Um, you know, kind of, I mean, I, I hats off to, to Nick Horby for writing about a bunch of damaged single men who kind of don't have their stuff together. Um, I maybe took a note from that. I, I, my character, Darby, she is a... Uh, she inherits a record store from her uncle kind of after her career goes awry in New York. She moved back to Chicago. She's starting to wonder why she ever left, what she thinks is about her, like, her engagement failing and her relationships failing and all the stuff that she screwed up. And uh, Long story short, she hears about this, uh, this, this train line called the gray line. We have the CTA in Chicago, and there's a red line and a blue line and a brown line. So I just kind of made up this, you know, fictional line. And, um, you know, the, the legend has it that, the gray line can take you back to the past. And the way the plot unfolds is, is that she discovers that there's a, tr there's a stop for the gray line under a record store. So uh, once she gets enough beer muscles or nerves, she decides to go back to the 1990s to kind of fix some things or make amends. And because of the music and how much she loves the, the, the locale, she ends up having a little bit too much fun in the 90s and actually not dealing with her stuff. And that's kind of another, another piece of it all together. So... It's fun to write, and I just it let me steep myself back in the past and pop culture, but also like '90s technology and how different mundane things were then compared to now. Who would you consider a role model for you or a hero? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we always say our parents, of course, because they they see us through the early stages in life. But I mean, creatively, like I don't know. In 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 work, in my job, I never had a mentor. I'm not trying to like say I'm a genius, but like I've always worked jobs where I've always had to figure it out. So I have this kind of entrepreneurial mindset. I don't know. Maybe I look at um, – maybe I just role models of people I, I take. I look at what they've done. Like Mark Cuban, I think, is really great, what he's done. And he's took some of his money from the, his investments in early technology and you know, brought the Dallas Mavericks to win a championship, and he's still around, and he's still involved in business. And yeah, I think he's one person that I think is uh, – you know, I kind of want to sit next to him at a Mavs game and listen to him yell and, and I want to see him get thrown out because I bet that would be, that would be a reporting time. Uh, you know, some of the writers that, some of the writers that I, I, I kind of look to, you know, are long since past, like Jack Kerouac and, uh, George Plimpton. But yeah, I don't know if I have one role model. I, I just kind of look at different things that people have done that I, I enjoy and try to take inspiration. Uh, a little side note, I've, I've done improv comedy in Chicago, which is a Chicago thing for a while, and uh, produced a group called The Disappointments. We had our, our last show was actually right before the pandemic really started, but we've uh, done some shows in Second City. So I originally took um, improv at, at IO Theater, and there's a, a guy who founded it with Sean Helper, and his name is Del Close. Del Close, if you watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Del Close is kind of like the crazy... Uh, English professor who's talking about there's there's Ben Stein and then there's another teacher who's talking about um, I don't think like a James Joyce novel and he's kind of crazy and boring and he's scratching the chalk on the so that's Del Close he was in Ferris Bueller's Day Off and a couple other movies and I kind of looked to him as like someone who founded something that I use because doing improvisational comedy and learning it has really helped me with my dialogue because I, I, there's probably courses you can take about writing dialogue and fiction but when you're doing improv on stage and you're trying not to mess it up, you break bad habits and you learn how to become real uh, in your dialogue to make it work. And, you know, Del Close, is, he developed that originally. And that maybe that's, uh, if I had to talk to a dead person about, hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for the tips and looking over my shoulder, I suppose Del Close, the you know, kind of founder of Chicago Improv Comedy, would be, you know, maybe that person. So everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your readers, your fans, but ultimately you live your life. Who yeah. do you think you are? I think I'm someone who's nuts and bolts and just likes to enjoy life. I've got a, you know, a lot of opinions and a lot of things that I want to do, but um, you know, I really like hanging out with, with friends and family and just having like a three-hour lunch or you know, making stupid bathroom humor. Like I'm not too buttoned up. But I think I take, you know, the good things in life seriously. And uh, I think, you know, every moment counts. So, yeah, I'm someone who tries to enjoy life and wants to maximize, maximize it the most. But I don't really get too hung up on, like, I think about the fact that in my business career, I had a lot of great opportunities. But one thing when you're working, when you work in the information technology, if you're not, like, 
a computer scientist by by true trade, you the, you get bounced around a lot. There's a lot of projects that end, and you know your manager gets fired, so you get laid off. If I think about, you know, if, if I was going to quantify or qualify myself by, you know, my the titles on my business card, I would probably be a failure because I've never been a vice president of anything. I've never, you know, I can't really. I've had a lot of cool opportunities, but I've I've never really. You know, been sort of the model, the, the model corporate citizen, and I think that maybe informs my journey in writing and sort of put me in the in the direction that I that I've been going that I am now. So, yeah, something that I'm kind of a maybe t-shirt and jeans kind of a person, but you know, I can put on a suit if I need to and hobnob with the best of them. But I just try to enjoy life and do what I do well. So, how can everybody pick up the book, learn more about you, and anything that's going on in your world? Where's the best place to go? Yeah, so uh, the website for the book is 90daysinthe90s.com. It's, you know, 90, the number, so it's 90, you know, 90daysinthe90s.com. If you want to order the book direct from me, I'll sign it for you and send some swag uh, along with it. Otherwise, you know, if you're someone who buys all your books on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com, it's up there too. Uh, it just kind of depends on what your preference is. And if you live in Chicago, um, you know, I'm starting to do some bookstore appearances and, and different types of things. So uh, maybe just look at my website or or keeping your ear out for me. But, um, yeah, I think everybody does everything online nowadays. I've had friends who told me that they bought the book from Amazon. Um, you know, if you get free shipping, maybe that's uh, that's one way to go. But, yeah, if, uh, other than that, you, there's starting to be some some reviews are starting to come out of it. But it's, it's only been six weeks. I mean, I feel like this is a new project for me, and I'm just kind of starting to tell the story about the book and the reception I've, to get back to one of your other questions, the receptions I've gotten, primarily from people in my age group or people who like music, is like, you know, I always hear that this could be a movie. I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll stalk, uh, I'll stalk, uh, John Cusack outside his house to hold up a boombox and, you know, see if he pays attention to me, like, and say anything. But I think, uh, the, perce- the reception's been good. People who like music and pop culture, I think, will like this book. Even if you don't like, you know, if you're not a fan of the same bands that I am or that the, the protagonist is, I think there's a lot, there's a lot in there. And if you've ever been to Chicago and enjoyed it, definitely you'll uh, you'll have find something that you like in the book. Beautiful man, Andy. Thank you for opening up. Good luck with the book and all the sports adventures. I appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate you having me on. Thanks for tuning in to another famous interview with Joe Domino, where we cover the world of art, literature, and music around the globe. If you want to hear more interviews, visit the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino channel on YouTube. Thanks again for listening, and until next time. <music>